morning, everyone. If everyone could please grab a seat and silence your phones, we'd like to get started. My name is Felix Filippo, and I am the associate publisher of The Atlantic, here to introduce our next panel on investing during turbulent times. Moderating this discussion will be Ranji Nagaswamy. Ranji is currently the chief investment officer for Lions Bernstein, where she's been since 2004. I hear louder. All right, Ranji is currently the chief investment officer for Alliance Bernstein, where she has been since 2004. Uh, she is responsible for growth, value, and core stock, as well as fixed income investments. She also co-chairs the Retail Investors Investment Policy Group, as well as being the senior portfolio manager for the U.S. Value Equities team since 2001. Before Alliance Bernstein in, two, in 09, 99, I'm sorry, she was with U.S. UBS Asset Management holds a degree from Yale, MBA from Yale, as well as a degree from Bombay. With that, I'll turn it over to Ranji um, for the next panel. Great. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, we've heard a lot of big ideas on regulatory reform, uh, restoring liquidity, and certainly confidence in the economy. Our goal, even though we're at the Ideas Festival, is to turn ideas into action. And what we'd like to really talk about is take some of these broad prescriptives as a backdrop and speak very specifically to what we as investors should think about doing in the capital markets. What is the setting? Where are the opportunities? Where are the potential pitfalls? And many still lie ahead of us. And to do this with me today, I am joined by a rather distinguished panel. To my right, uh, Bill Mayer, Chairman Emeritus of the Aspen Institute, a principal investor in private equity today. And uh, in a pre-maligned world, uh, was the CEO of Credit Suisse First Boston on, on Wall Street for many years. I take a deep and particular pleasure in asking Bill questions today. As my mentor in the Henry Crown Fellowship, he has spent the last four years asking me unanswerable <laughs> questions. <laughs> to Bill's right, uh, Mike Wylands, who uh, a year ago joined Fidelity as Chief Investment Officer and Head of Asset Management. Uh, our 2.7 trillion man on this panel. Uh, what is uh, probably more interesting about Mike was he joined as the 3.7 trillion <laughs> man, so Fidelity is still looking for a trillion dollars. Uh, to my left, Chris Hizzy, who is a managing director and chief investment officer of U.S. Trust private wealth management effort, and Chris will really speak very broadly to many asset classes and markets. And finally, uh, but hardly the least, Arjun Gupta to my far left, head of Telesoft Partners, a venture capital firm focused on the technology sector. Arjun and his team have uh, invested in and helped build over 60 companies. Arjun is a trustee of the Institute and also a Henry Crown Fellow. Uh, gentlemen, one basic view we have heard a lot about in the last day and a half is this idea that the economy and the financial markets are out of ICU but still in critical care. Uh, from your vantage points, really, across the capital markets in the private equity and venture capital world, using that as a backdrop, could you care to comment on what has just happened, where you see some of the biggest opportunities and pitfalls, taking, if possible, less than three minutes to summarize? We'll start with you, Bill. <laughs> three minutes or less. Well, you know, so far, this uh, for the Ideas Fest, we've heard a lot of this, so I'm not going to go over the ground that's already been plowed by others. So the world is upside down. Um, how long it will stay that way, I don't know. One of the things I have learned over the years is when you get an equilibrium that gets broken, and that's clearly what happened, it takes a long time, if you're lucky and you can muddle along, to reestablish what I call a new normal. So when we start talking about the future, of uh, not only the economy here, but around the world and what we do about it as investors, I try to create a picture of what it's liable to look like. And what we know is less leverage, slower growth, uh, credit more constrained, which should turn into lower returns for the investor going forward for some period of time. Uh, I take the view that we're out of ICU, but you know, by the time we get back to where we were in 2000 and the end of 2006 and the first half of 2007, maybe it takes seven years, maybe it takes 10 years. I don't have any idea. But to have sort of a, a, a pretty vibrant uh, a world, we don't actually have to get back to those levels. So I sort of 
don't worry too much about this concept of a V-shaped economy. I'm just looking for any kind of positive slope. Mike? Yes, yeah, so I don't repeat. I'll, I'll focus on a couple of things that are good news. I, when talking to people around the institute this morning, they were telling me there's a lot of pessimism. And, and unlike previous uh, uh, sessions, and, it, and I'm actually not pessimistic about it. Uh, I agree that there'll be a new equilibrium. Um, speaking from Fidelity's perspective, we actually saw extremely reasonable behavior by the 20 million folks that put their 401ks through us and their accounts where they, in fact, continued to save, continued to put money away for their retirement, didn't necessarily sell at the worst case, and essentially have a belief in the system going forward, although they're worried, like everybody else, as to how long it'll take and when they'll recover and all of those questions. Um, we see a lot of upside going forward, but probably not in all the same places that it was before. I think when you look at 2007 and 2006, a lot of the gains were fallacious. They were so levered that uh, you wouldn't want to repeat those even if you could because of the volatility that it brought to the market. So I'll just sort of conclude, and we can answer it later, that there's a whole set of differences we think going forward that would be opportunities for investment that you'll see Fidelity offer to the market because we think how investors will go into the market will be different going forward. Well, I, I think uh, on the margin, uh, we simply can't make the same mistakes on the upside as we made on the downside, which is not trusting certain indicators out there that are actually peaking above ground, and whether you call them green shoots or you know first derivatives or second derivatives, to me, it's, it's really to what Bill and Mike said, which is we are in the sweet spot right now. Forget about what we're going to grow at, whether it's 2 or 3 percent, what equilibrium may be, uh, but, but Bill's is dead on. We're moving from the end of the recession, which is likely to be this month, um, into a recovery. And this recovery period is going to be more about repair and then a full recovery, and that has a lot of implications for it, and it's the sweet spot when you get rising growth, falling inflation, and that benefits all reflationary assets. So we're quite optimistic. Uh, I'm not going to call us massively bullish. We're certainly not bearish. Um, we've been discussing something called a moose market for quite a while now, and it's somewhere in between. <laughs> <laughs> moose market, Arjun? Well, uh, you know, I'm from the private markets and mostly on the tech sector, so kind of wireless technology. Um, and, and historically, we've been in IT. And going forward, uh, we are very much in the kind of uh, IT intensive part of the energy value chain. So shall, shall I say the next generation power network, the smart grid, et cetera. I'm also a contrarian investor. And so I fundamentally have made my best investments in downturns. Uh, so I do think there's a kind of a, a set of strategies that we have to take uh, for the current portfolio and then look forward to the next generation. So clearly in the current portfolio, we were over-invested, we were too broad, so rationalizing the portfolio, cutting costs, taking on very, very tough cost structure type uh, 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 decisions like 20% uh, salary cuts across the board. These are all very, very tough to implement, but once you get that cost structure aligned, start realigning to, to current realities, I do think going forward, there's a, a fairly large number of opportunities, both in the short term from when I was talking to Mike earlier, uh, almost like a distressed asset class. So last capital in is resetting all terms and will be first capital out. And so you have a, a fairly significant opportunity, shall I say, in the 12 to 24 month uh, period, and then looking for the next set of opportunities that may, may, may be more in the five to seven year horizon. Well, let's let, dig a little deeper into the individual <coughs> asset classes. And perhaps, Chris, if I can ask you to start at the broadest level, mm -hmm. uh, if Chris and Mike can comment on public equities and bonds and maybe the dollar, and um, Bill and Arjun can speak to the alternative sector. What do you see as the needed catalyst? You, you talk about being in a sweet spot, but where are we going to move from repair to recovery, to use your words? And can you be a little more specific about sure. liquidity issues in the bond markets, risk premia, credit premia? Sure. The, the, the bull camp wants a consumer to relever themselves. The, the bear camp wants a consumer to never do anything again. Uh, there's a camp in the middle, that is repair, where the consumer has to repair their balance sheet. Same thing in the financial sector and in the small business segment. We've been seeing this happening really since um, the massive stimulus that was put in place last January. 
as that came through the four catalysts that are needed in any market cycle, whether you go in from a deep depression or in a, a nasty recession, is trust and confidence. Without trust and confidence, rising on the margin, you don't get rising, rising asset prices. And we're finally getting that. That happened, it kick-started in March. The public equity market started to rise. There was significant washout. There was almost anywhere, whatever statistic you use, there was between eight and $11 trillion in cash on the sidelines. But about the entire US stock market and probably all of Canada. So I look at that, I look at trust and confidence start to rise, and then the taker, as Arjun said, comes back into the marketplace when that feeds on itself, and that's where we are right now. So for public equities, uh, we've been looking at a range of 850 to 1150 on the S&P. We think you can get close to 1100 by the end of the year, as long as the second part of the rally, which is the earnings phase, hits uh, with surprises. And that's all about energy and the financials, and those are the two areas that we think can surprise. And that should lift, uh, lift the market higher. But the biggest beneficiaries of all that will continue to be US small caps, the emerging market uh, landscape, even though they've really risen significantly uh, and are ripe for a small pullback. But it's commodities, it's natural resources, it's emerging market equities, it's the small caps. And quite frankly, those are the healthier areas uh, of the world. On the premium side, uh, as it relates to bonds, um, it's still high quality. Uh, I know it sounds counterintuitive, if you like small caps, you should like high yield. Um, the reality is we're not willing to put our entire risk budget to work in any one flare gun that goes <coughs> off. So we're going to work it in, in, in episodes. And right now, we're still neutral on, on high yield, but we're all about investment grade bonds right now. We still think spreads are too wide. The credit markets told us that we were coming into this downturn. They're telling us that we're coming out of it. You have to look at investment grade bonds and high quality municipal bonds. Would you agree with that, Mike? Take a different stance? In the short and medium term, I completely agree. Probably um, the biggest change that you're seeing in our stance is that we're increasingly spinning up alternative asset classes that would protect you from what could be very high inflation rates a couple years out uh, or weakening of the dollar. So you, you will see commodity funds start to come up in, in formats that are probably uh, consumable by uh, normal investors, uh, Forex exchange, all these things that people use to protect themselves in high inflation, soft dollar worlds will be added to portfolios in uh, reasonable amounts, not 2%, not 3%, you're talking uh, 15 and 20%. And you'll also see international global equities start to really creep into portfolios much more than you would have seen historically. So pre-meltdown, I think, uh, you know, it was a, a bond equity sort of trade-off. I think post-meltdown, you're going to be seeing a lot more people of all means having a much more complex portfolio in order to try to get uncorrelated uh, assets into that portfolio. Does that worry you, Bill, that complexity brings investors who don't understand the alternative space? Well, I'm not sure that those of us that are in the alternative area understand it either. <laughs> so, you know, let's be a little careful here. Because if any one of us had the real answer, we wouldn't be in the room. We'd be somewhere else. And so uh, we're all finding, finding our, uh, our own way. Uh, I think Chris mentioned the first half of the two things I think are really critical. And one is confidence. Because without confidence, I don't think you can have credit. Without credit, I know you don't have an economy anywhere in the world. And so the question is, how do you develop confidence which will lead to credit availability on some terms? And I think it just takes time. And so if we, in fact, are in a period of bottoming, and this goes on for a while longer, you pick your number of months, two months, four months, five months, at some point, we all start coming out of our respective personal foxholes, which is where we've all been like this, and all of the cash on the sideline should provide credit as we, uh, as we go forward. And credit, of course, is one of the things that makes the, uh, uh, at least the whole private, what is called private equity area work. And once we, once again, I think we've learned uh, one of the problems with debt, and that is that people actually expect you to pay it back. Okay? If it weren't for that, debt would be just fine. So here we are in a leveraged situation because that's what allows you to make the returns in private equity. Because if you're going to make, you know, there's only three things that work, right? You know, your risk, your liquidity, and your yield. And so that's it. It's the only three things we ever have to worry about in investing money. 
And so in the private area, if you're going to give up your liquidity <coughs> and you're going to take more risk, therefore you should have higher yield. It's going to be very, very difficult to generate the kind of yield levels that you would consider to be sufficient to justify the lack of liquidity in the private equity area without the leverage we've had in the past. And I don't think you're going to have the leverage we've had in the past for some time. I, once again, I don't know whether it's five or seven years. So for the immediate future, uh, the only caveat to what I've said is what Arjun mentioned, and is that if you view this as a distressed situation, where your last money going in ends up owning most of the equity, which is happening in some cases, but that's not really, that may be available to people up here. I know a lot of people in the audience, it's available certainly to some of you, but for the population as a whole, of course, yeah. it's not available except through some kind of intermediate vehicle, intermediary vehicle. Uh, you make an important point of hubris and humility, uh, and I want to come back to you on this point of private equity returns having been so dominated by leverage, which isn't how you operate a company, it's financial engineering. Um, where is the shift within private equity to going back and being long-term value investors with managements, going in and operating companies? Do you see the fundamental nature of what comprises returns within private equity shifting? No, I, you know, I'm, one of our portfolio companies, we're fighting with the senior lenders to redo things. And, uh, you know, company still has positive cash flow. And there is a real business there. And we're working with management. We just got a balance sheet. So I make a huge distinction between the income statement and the balance sheet. Yeah. And I think what you're finding here, at least in the private equity world, you have a lot of balance sheets that were structured for a different level, to state the obvious, a different level and higher level of cash flow. So I don't think the dynamic in most of the firms with the managements, frankly, will be very different. But, but from the operating perspective for a private equity investor, are you, do you think we are now more focused in the new normal on helping companies restructure themselves and operate rather than well, simply relying on leverage to that's, produce returns? Well, that's, that's what I always thought we were trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> it may not have been the source of returns, but fair enough. Well, let me just take a different crack at uh, both the confidence question as well as the leverage question. So first, uh, in the technology sector, we really don't take any leverage. So it's all re really partnering for long-term perspective with, uh, with management. The problem became you started getting very used to and addicted to very quick returns, you know, a couple rounds, and you saw what the IPO values were, which were billions of dollars, and you worked backwards. To the question of both confidence as well as money on the, on the sidelines, uh, it's intricate and very kind of uh, complex and interlinked, but let's just take that data from 1-1-1980, which was about the start of the PC, till about mid-96, which was roughly when uh, Netscape went public, so I'm trying to normalize out any data with respect to the internet bubble. There were 801 technology IPOs on, uh, on NASDAQ, right? So 800 IPOs, roughly 16 years, 50 a year, roughly one a week on average. Now, the average doesn't make a lot of sense because it, there's a ramp, but I would argue that a barometer of a healthy capital market would be roughly one a week where confidence of suppliers of capital with the users of capital is coming together. Some percentage really wins, some per percentage uh, uh, run out. There were no IPOs in uh, fourth quarter last year, no IPOs in the, in the first quarter of this year. We've had one or two go out, but, but we really have to get that whole link back and slowly, uh, as you saw with, uh, uh, with the open table and a couple others that just went out, mm -hmm. you're starting to see both the people who have the capital, large amounts like, uh, like Fidelity or, or US Trust, really looking for those next generation of companies. Uh, so I think that's gonna start coming back. The flip side of that is if it doesn't come back, there's a vicious cycle because the companies then, even with your concept of partnering with management, which is what we do, negative cash flow is negative cash flow. Someone has to fund it. So you have to start writing more checks. The more checks you write, the longer it takes to, to come out investors don't see returns, their public equities are going down, so the denominator of the asset allocation is going down. Your asset, uh, you know, the, the percentage allocated to, the, to private equity or, or technology venture capital goes up, and it's a vicious cycle. So my argument has always been that we have to really bring back the overall capital markets platform mm -hmm. and the confidence in a, very wide, you know, in a very broad structure where the users of capital and the suppliers of capital can come together under a regulatory and, and legal framework. And I think that's where we've, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I, I would say if you take that concept into the uh, tactical, the shorter term, what's going on now, and the strategic, the longer term, you have the same pool of, uh, of muck going on, which is 
This is the great convergence period. We haven't seen in 50 years what's going on right now, which is the short-term dislocation in the business and the economic cycle is accelerating this long-term secular growth shift from the rich world to the developed world. Mm -hmm. The same thing is happening in each of the individual sectors that we're all talking about. So when you talk about opportunities, th this, this is a garden of opportunities. Um, and I would argue that of the last few business cycles, whether it was built on leverage or not, whether it was a tech bubble back before, whether it was a Japanese equity market bubble or the natural resources bubble in the 70s, you're now looking at a time where you're going to have to do more with less. And that ultimately is harder yeah. to find the opportunities, but when you find them, the outsized returns are significant. So add discipline to trust and confidence and credit. Novel idea. Right? <laughs> Novel yeah. idea. Uh, we've not commented about a few other asset classes. I'll just throw it open to anybody who wants to jump in. Commercial real estate, hedge funds, emerging markets, if you sort of take them as a risk class on their own, and the dollar. How about it? Okay, commercial real estate. Um, we heard a lot about that in the uh, panel yesterday morning, and uh, that is thought to be uh, the current quote problem in the in the financial sector. So we've segues from mortgages, and uh, we're into commercial loans. We've talked about retail credit cards and so forth. I think in the commercial <coughs> real estate, I think as we all know, there's an awful lot of debt that has to be refinanced over the over sometime between the end of this year and the end of 2011. And how that gets done is going to be a very interesting uh, thing to observe and watch and maybe participate in because there has to be uh, some really good values. Now, really good values, you know, is a function of your own confidence in the future. So in spite of what everybody was saying last fall, we found out the sun always did come up in the east, okay? And people do get on with their business and their life. And in the United States, we tend to have sort of an upbeat point of view. So down the road, I think that the uh, uh, commercial real estate area presents a terrific opportunity to make some investments at the, really at the distressed level. How you find those and how you judge in your own way what the demographics are for the area that that commercial real estate is and what the opportunity for, uh, for recovery is, because I think you're quite right talking about for the next number of months, this is about recovery. This really isn't about, about growth per se. And by the way, jobs are going to lag behind all of this and probably be the last thing where you'll see some kind of a, a, a pickup and an, an improvement. Chris, you want to take the dollar? I'll take the dollar. Uh, the dollar is um, going to be bipolar, uh, in, our, in our opinion. Right. And the dollar will be strengthening in the short term versus the euro. The euro, in our opinion, is way too overvalued, given the fact that they just don't have the flexibility, the dynamism in their economy that, like we do. Um, right now, it's a little bit of a flow analysis going on why the euro is strengthened. But we expect the dollar to kind of recoup some of their lost um, uh, traction against the euro, maybe slightly against the pound itself. Uh, but by and large, if you just think about a long-term investor right now, a basket of emerging market currencies, currencies work off of a few things, purchasing power, parity, flows, and then confidence. And right now, if you believe that there's a consumer dynamic being developed in emerging markets, you've got to believe that the financial systems come after that, and then housing, and then you start to see growth, and all of that leads to rising currencies. So for us, it's about a basket of emerging market currency strengthening versus the dollar, and in the short term, the dollar actually strengthening versus the euro. Commodity currencies are a little bit uh, of a different animal, if you will. Um, we believe in reflationary um, assets, both in the short term and long term. So um, they just tend to go through massive peaks and valleys. And right now, they're a little rich. But um, certainly, um, the loonie and, and the kiwi and the Aussie dollar are areas of interest over the next five years. Mike, uh, you spoke a little bit to some alternative strategies that even regular investors will need to sort of participate in. You might introduce new services for that. Really as a perspective to perhaps hedging against, you said two things, a lower dollar, a weaker dollar, which seems to be a consensus opinion uh, in general. I don't know right. if you share it. Um, and also inflation. Uh, talk about that a little bit more, if you would. Well, there's, there's multiple trades going on here. Um, before I came here, I debriefed. And one of the people that came up and was telling me stories was Peter Lynch. He's still very much alive and kicking and doing his own investing. He advises us. And he told me the story that in the early mid-70s, about 74, there was another meltdown. Now, Peter is very 
emotional. You know, on one day he's telling me that we're going to be eating bark off of trees, <laughs> and then the next day, you know, he's putting all his money back into the market. Yeah. So he's he's a very uh, passionate investor. But he told me in '74 we had a similar kind of equity meltdown, and that that was the years he was knocking, putting in 20, 30, 40 percent year over year gains in the Magellan Fund, and he did that for four and five years in a row, and we couldn't give that fund away. No one was going into equities. It was way till 82 before Fidelity actually started to see money flows come back into equities after the 74 experience from common investors. So the asset classes there, though, were two. Either you were in fixed income, which was basically simple bonds, or you were in sort of a potpourri of equities that were run by people like Peter Lynch. Now, it's a completely different world today because of globalization, because of incredible dynamics like you know, trillion dollar debt numbers that go on for as far as you can see. Uh, and so, and I would say there's a third piece here that's gonna be with us for a very long time, which is increased volatility. Just as they say, deal with it. The world is not gonna go back to a small uh, thing. I think the, the volatility of, of our world is just there now. So when you put those together, it suggests that you want to widen the way you think of investing. You don't want to just look at bonds and, and you know, fixed income and equities. You have to look at a more sophisticated basket. Now, the problem is if you know what you're doing, it's hard. It's, as has been pointed out, professionals screw this up all the time. And so what you want to do it is in a very careful way. And there's a lot of companies out there that give you ways to get exposure to these baskets in very good ways from tips all the way down. And what I'm suggesting and what we're doing is making sure over the next 18 months that we include many more of these asset classes dialed back. We don't want too much octane because the average investor really does not enjoy, well, they enjoy the ride up uh, a whole <laughs> lot more than the ride down. And in fact, if you look at, our, we have behavioral economists that took me through this curve. There's a famous curve that basically says that losing a dollar is much more painful to the average person than gaining a dollar is pleasurable. And that causes emotional response to investing that causes really bad decision making. And so when you put your portfolios together with these alternative investments, the suggestion is, particularly for the average investor, is you make sure that there is some overlay that is essentially reallocates automatically and that you don't look at that every single day. That's the second thing I'll leave you with. If you want to make yourself risk adverse, there is also a behaviorally econometric sort of study that says the more you look at information, the more risk adverse you will be. And in fact, for the average investor, you know, the average time should be no more than a quarter, okay? And some people have suggested as much as a year. Um, it really depends on where you believe on that. So I'll leave it with that. Uh, I think you're quoting Daniel Kahneman's work, um, and it's literally a two-to-one ratio that the loss, uh, the pain of a loss is felt twice as yes. much as the pleasure of a gain. Hey, Ranji, if I can Please. take your earlier question of hedge, the role of hedge funds. They've been one of the most disruptive things for our business. And this is something the audience can actually help with. But if you really take a hedge fund, which is very short-term focus, and the venture uh, class is long-term focus, so we want five to seven-year returns kind of story. If you take the real data, which was the 801 IPOs I was telling you about, which is 100% of all uh, IPOs on NASDAQ over 16 years, the average valuation at exit was roughly 150 million on average. 300 million was the largest, which happened to be Microsoft, which then went up to 150 billion. Uh, hedge funds want to see billions of dollars of returns, very quick returns, and so they'll do all kinds of stuff behind the scenes that'll make, make that happen, which adds to the volatility which, uh, which Mike was talking about. And a hedge fund, by definition, was supposed to be hedging the risk. It was supposed to be taking longs and shorts, which you can't do in the private markets. And so they should really be out of the private markets. And what they were really doing was somehow their charter became large enough that they could come in and take late round uh, private uh, investments, which they started then pricing off their expectations of public right. offerings, which started going up. So if you look again at NASDAQ and the index, we've basically been reset by a decade. In 1999, NASDAQ was roughly 1,500, went up to 5,000, which I would argue most of which was this kind of hedge fund effect. It's back to 1,500. Well, on the way up, as we went from, let's say, 1980 to 1999, Coming to that 1500, everyone thought it was a great ride. It was better returns than we'd ever seen. You know, companies like Cisco and a bunch of other really big guys have been built during those times. 
but it was that whole peak to trough that really hurt. And so uh, I think there can be, we genuinely have to see asset classes and vehicles, much like the, you know, what, what Mike, you, you try to do, uh, to really make sure that people don't really jump out of the area, so to speak, and, and disrupt other markets in, in very long-term uh, ways. Just to add to, to what Ar Arjun said there, uh, technolo the technology sector is the single greatest performer. Um, the mm -hmm. NASDAQ is up, what, 18% uh, you know, year to date, 27% yeah. right. in the quarter. No one talks about it, and actually, they're cash-rich companies, no leverage, like you said, and so that that is a microcosm of what we should be investing in, and and, uh, and then maybe taking it a step step further. Without question, we had a financial asset inflated world for 30 years. We're going to a hard asset reflation world, where the economic transformation is going to drive those asset classes that Mike talked about. Um, Timber in portfolios is going to be talked about more and moving from residential and commercial real estate to fort, farmland, oil and gas, ranch and timber, uh, in our opinion, is the, is the wave. Um, one of the other asset class I want to make sure we touch on is the emerging markets. And a lot has been said from a policy perspective about the structural imbalances, the savings glut in the emerging world, particularly in Asia, and therefore the consumption excesses here. Um, Speak a little bit in this open question to uh, the decoupling in the emerging markets. Uh, many believe that there is a much greater opportunity to invest in the higher risk countries. Well, one thing about emerging markets, which, which is uh, a really good piece of news, is um, when you're looking at how to invest into emerging markets, what you'll find is it's one of the few places left on the planet where the information horizon is not level. In the US, there was a law passed called Reg FD, which essentially flattened the ability for mutual funds and investors to get information from public companies. And so the consequence of that, as you'll see, is index funds and are in a fight with actively managed funds for who's going to actually contribute the best way to invest. Overseas, that's not the case. Overseas, first of all, there aren't rules like that. And those investment organizations that actually have research organizations and capabilities to talk and get deep into these emerging markets will be able to yield very good returns for you in, and should be part of your portfolio. It is a big deal and uh, fidelity for sure, but I think if you look at every other serious investing organization is investing heavily to build out their research capability around the world for exactly that reason, particularly in emerging markets. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. In, in the technology sector, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, there are three things that are fairly different in, in the non-US market, shall I say. One is we've, we have adopted SOX, which in effect is a tax. And especially on small companies, applying the same process as to very large companies, you take a profitable company and you bas basically make it unprofitable. Second, I would argue, if you look at all the scandals, they've never come from fresh, fresh companies. The companies are and management team are far too focused on trying to just make their numbers as opposed to kind of uh, uh, the shenanigans. Uh, second, when you take the split of research versus investment banking. So small companies that don't have resources really need research done so that it can be feed on the street that a lot of large public investors can, can get access to, to your point. Clearly, Fidelity could probably own its own research, but, but uh, uh, you know, other, other, a lot of uh, smaller institutional investors would require more public research. Well, in this country, with the split of research with investment banking, there is very little research capability now being channeled onto right. small, fresh companies. Well, guess what? Google had to be small before it got big. Cisco had to be small before it got big. Well, if you don't have any research there, you're not getting a widespread investor base. If you don't have an investor base, you're not getting to the radar of the long-term investors, et cetera. So it's, again, a vicious cycle. And the third is the distribution channels. Um, so in this country, we, we've uh, clearly, sh but surely, been uh, uh, destroying the boutique banks. Almost no one has critical mass. Maybe there'll be a second wave that comes back. But in the emerging markets, both especially China and India, you're starting to see local markets, uh, local capital markets where you can get liquidity, local distribution channels that have wide, uh, you know, broad-based uh, 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 distribution capability and research, which can bring uh, the companies on the radars of the, of the largest uh, institutional investors. If, if there's one investment tenant to, to take from a lot of this is, you can't have a healthy country, per se, without a healthy financial system. Mm -hmm. And when you look at um, whatever investment you go into, whatever country, emerging markets, or the developed world, 
have to make a sense of their financial stability, number one, and then their banking system, and then their banks, et cetera, and the free flow of capital markets and all that. And we've seen a sea change. I mean, the 1990s, you had one currency crisis after another in the emerging markets. You had the tequila crisis in Mexico in 94, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thai bot in 97, the Russian ruble in 98, and so on. And now we're actually seeing 98% of emerging markets have a surplus. So they have a very strong movement towards capitalistic uh, uh, societies, et cetera. And the biggest and most important thing is they have a consumer dynamic that's willing to spend some of that savings glut. And this whole vendor financing agreement that Asia has had with the United States is slowly seeping away. And they're building domestic economies. So for the next 10 years, forget the cyclicality of these emerging markets. That rise is going to continue, I in agree. my opinion. So, Please. <clears throat> So we're talking here, and as I'm, I'm listening, as everybody else is, you say, wait a second. So we were told uh, that we're going through a once in a hundred year event, okay? Well, we went through the Russian, you know, it seems like about every eight years we're having a once in a hundred right. year event. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, that is uh, part of the reason for volatility is nobody's willing to play the, uh, the facilitator in the middle to moderate in the, in the classic days up until about 15 years ago, if you had a trading operation, you were trying to take a position to try to stabilize the buy and the sell interest. That's all gone, so you're going to have that. But what I think we all learned is we talk about diversification into asset classes, but with the exception of treasury bills, and if you want to, we were talking at breakfast, maybe gold, it turns out there was no place to hide. There was no place to hide domestically. There was no place to hide anywhere around the world. And so you, saw, you say to yourself, well, why should I bother? And, you know, everybody got whacked pretty good. And so as I'm, as, I, as I'm trying to think through that going forward, you say, well, all right, fine. One of the lessons that we know is that a little bit like a, a university endowment, you better calculate how much cash you think you need for some period of time, three, four, five years, mm -hmm. and you better have that liquidity around because uh, cash may be hard to find. So one of the changes, I think, is that all of us going forward will maintain a little higher liquidity margin mm -hmm. yep. okay, for all of us so that we're not faced with, what am I going to do here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe one of the bigger changes we'll see. And so when you talk about U.S. Trust, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, they are these huge cash balances in the individual accounts of all of the customers, adding up to a significant, I mean, really, what was the number you were saying? Four trillion in money markets. Four, four trillion. Now, if that ever got deployed in the market, more or less the way everybody tried to exit, because right. we also found out <laughs> everybody tries to get out of the door at the same time, can't be done. Everybody tries to come in, you'll have the volatility the other way. My guess is a lot of that is gonna stay on the sidelines for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And when you start talking about the asset classes, one of the things I think I figured out is, bond stocks, I better look through, you know, and see what the inherent risk is that I'm taking overall. Right. And I, so I, I sort of no longer think of the world as large cap, small cap value, growth, mm -hmm. international, emerging market, and the same thing in the, in the fixed income area. It's trying to think through as a mosaic is what kind of risk profile am I comfortable having my, myself going, going forward. So I think all of us end up, uh, what we should always have been doing is trying to work backwards. What are my own, what are my own needs? What, are my own, what is my own risk profile uh, going, going forward? I tend to have a higher risk profile than, than a lot of people. I tend to take a barbell approach, you know, try to have a fair amount of cash, have a lot of stuff that's relatively illiquid. It's not right, it's not wrong, but it's somewhat a personal preference. And I think that's part of the difficulty in meshing what I describe as the traditional world we had until a little over a year ago, and to what we're liable to see going forward, and providing products that people can actually say, that actually meets the need I think I have. You Although I'll just add one thing, Bill, <laughs> Arjun's rule of thumb here. But uh, you know, most people want to buy low and sell high, but Which, I think they this end is also up, true. They end up selling at the lows and buying at the highs. Yeah. And so you just, just want to make sure that you kind of think through that piece. <laughs> Well, yeah. to that point, the, there's a lot of these life cycle funds. These are the automatic balancing funds. And uh, a colleague of mine who was one of the architects of these things, Ren Chang, was pointing out that the real value of these things is not the auto balancing. It's really to eliminate the emotional 
aspects of investing. And the way he describes those, in fact, is he says there's seatbelts in a roller coaster. He says the roller coaster goes up, the roller coaster goes down, you puke, but you're still in the roller coaster. <laughs> okay. And in fact, when we did a back testing over the last 40 years of about 100,000 investors with $100,000 or more in, in nominal dollars, what we found out is those who did self-directed investing ended up taking off about half of their uh, returns by essentially selling and buying at exactly the wrong times because of those emotional cues. Mm -hmm. So however you do it, you need to find a way to distance yourself from the emotion as you go through this. Uh, it doesn't mean be silly, it just means this is not your friend under these conditions. Right. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I think uh, if, if, if you again use the same uh, real data, which is we're resetting by 10 years, and go back to what your asset allocations potentially were 10 years ago and the way you kind of thought about returns, I think that's a reasonable barometer to think of where you should be right now. Yeah, just to add, add to, the, to the point about the risk budget, um, you know, the, the viewpoint of diversification, it, it kind of is, is the D word that everybody uses. And the question is, is what does that really mean for that individual person? And Bill said it best, is he has a higher risk profile. There's a lot of barbell investors out there, those who want to hide the liquidity portion and the high cash portion. And then there's that bell curve, that right in the middle where you have those investors out there that say, I need to be as diversified as, as possible. For us, what that means for us in the industry, in my opinion, is building a risk budget in each of the asset classes. Mm -hmm. So with inequities, what's your risk budget and what's your ultimate cash flow that you want to come out of equities? Same thing in fixed income and what do alternatives mean for your portfolio? It's the positioning of it. Uh, what does gold provide? Is it a hedge or is it an investment? And, and you ask all those questions and then you get down to the bottom of all this and you say you have a 10-year yield at 3% or 3.5, um, maybe on its way to 4, whatever it is, you can't possibly produce returns above 6%, so another 3% above that on an in and out basis constantly. So that's your hurdle rate. And then you look at the pension funds, their hurdle rate is 5%. And then you look at investment grade bonds and you say, you can get that investment grade bonds right now. So there's so many different ways to look at this, but I couldn't agree more with Bill that this is a risk budgeting process in each of the individual asset classes. And we're gonna see a lot of high, high liquid cash in the silence for a while. You know, so many, we all, the problem with buying a high grade bond that yields 7% is it's really not very much fun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. True. And and I'm, I'm, I'm being You're actually right. quite serious yeah. here. Yeah. Is right. that investing? A lot of people. This is partly time in your concept of emotion. Is that you know we want to be active. We want to read all of the time, and it to be fun. And and I'm not sure how compatible it is with a disciplined approach, but it is a real problem, and it's part of what you talked about. No, there's no question about it. And in that barbell approach, you might want to allocate a little bit more to emerging market equities and have that high-grade bond as your barbell as well. Yes. So. There's one other thing I think that, that needs to be said, which is much to most people's surprise, when they actually look at the difference between equities and fixed income, you know, in equities, I think what, there's maybe 8,500 names worldwide, 13,000 if you do every small company. It's actually pretty straightforward. You have to call the companies right. It's a simpler process. When you go to bonds, you know, Fidelity files at least 120,000 different names, and that's not even if you do the global thing. It's rocket science. It's harder in many ways to do it well. And so the, the, the thing I'd like to leave you with is if, if you're gonna go to safety and you think bonds are safe, be very careful, particularly in these days, because in fact, they're getting much more treacherous than they ever were before, and make sure you you, whoever is doing that work for you knows what the hell they're doing. This is not necessarily the safe haven for money it used to be, particularly under the current situation. I want to come back to this asset allocation uh, point, and Mike, going back to some of the things you said about life cycle funds. So these are funds that you go out, you pick a retirement date, and then your asset manager does the rebalancing, takes the emotion out, so that you own more equities when you are younger, and then you go to a more conservative um, mix with more bonds uh, at a later stage. But even those plans fail to protect investors at this time. And a whole uh, theory is emerging about whether investors need some form of, and Zev Bodhi is actually at the leading edge of this, of insurance. Basically saying that what the federal government should do and Aspen's Initiative on Financial Security has also written a paper on this, uh, offer guaranteed life cycle funds, where there is some 
threshold you're willing to pay Sounds some <laughs> well yeah. it, it's it's basically the annuity business without the crazy fees but simply saying that in fact in investing what you really care about for the retiree for the average investor maybe nobody in this room but for the vast millions what you, they really care about is not losing capital right okay so th there's two answers you know that i have <coughs> this is gets very personal i was recently at a seminar and someone asked the question, what's the biggest Ponzi scheme that anybody's ever had? You know, and I, you know, I think they were looking for the answer made off, okay? But what I raised my hand and said Social Security, okay? <laughs> because that was the wrong place to give that answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you look at these public kind of pension plans right now that have guarantees that are underwritten, you will see essentially probably the worst unfunded liability situation. I mean, if you want to be depressed, go look at what that, what's going on in those spaces. So I don't know that that's a great model to put our whole retirement system on. What I can tell you is you're right. During the fourth quarter, the, these life cycle funds did not perform for the reasons that Bill has already just talked about. Unless you were all in treasuries and a little bit of gold, everything went down. But Sometimes you have to look at these things a different way. Most people say my average fund went down 17 or 20 percent, and they average all their assets across it. The other way to look at a retirement fund is vertically. And this goes to your point of, do you have enough cash in your fund and liquid liquidity so that you can live or retire on that for the five or six or seven years it takes for some of your other assets to go through their normal cycles? That's a liquidity issue which these funds did actually oh, pretty well. And a lot of those funds, by the way, have done very well year to date in uh, 2009. They're not back to where they were, but they've recovered a lot of their space. So I think there's work to be done there. One last thing there that is a real problem in the industry, and there will be regulation on this, and I think it's totally appropriate, and that's the labeling of these things is not very consistent. When someone says it's a 2020 fund, some companies mean you take all your money out in 2020, other ones mean you start to retire in 2020, but you need 20 years or 30 years to take it out. And as a consequence, they're, they're not apples to oranges. There are some 2020 funds that had 20% equity and some that had 60% equity trying to accomplish completely different things with the same labels. That's a massive labeling and disclosure issue, which absolutely needs to be fixed to, to, to make the industry better. Uh, just to add uh, one point to that is, is um, everybody wants to always be above their previous peak. And I think being above your previous peak versus can you meet your long-term goals are two very different mm -hmm. things. And I think it's really speaking to what Bill and Mike had already mm -hmm. discussed about right. cash flow and about asset liability matching and things like that. And trying to beat your previous peak is, is, is um, an area that uh, we should contain to sports and some other things. <laughs> There's one, one other comment that was interesting. I'll just tell you an interesting story. Fidelity looked at a product line where it was a guarantee. Once you turn 55, it was a guarantee of we would guarantee your high water mark. This is essentially what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of insurance companies came to us, 12 of them, in a consortia, and they said, we'll, we'll do this for 80, 80 basis points starting on the fee. We thought, well, okay, that's pretty good. Then the next week they said, okay, we meant 120 basis points. And the next week's 160 <laughs> basis points, you know, 1.6%. The problem was all of our senior investors who absolutely want to put this product in the market looked at those insurance companies and said, can we in good faith put our investors into this when 40 years from now those insurance companies have to be here to pay out, okay, given what's going on. So they'll do the guarantee, but who the hell is going to guarantee them? Right? And is that fair to put that kind of Probably false okay. ex <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so the whole thing cycles on itself and we stepped away saying that this, this is not the answer, okay? Mm -hmm. This is not the answer. I, I, I think an answer is needed, but mm -hmm. that's not a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the government isn't it either. I don't right, think so. As you said. Um, well, I'll, take, I'll have one more question, but if people have questions, there are two microphones, so uh, we'll open it up to the audience right after this one. I want to turn a little bit to humility and introspection on the panel. Uh, with a handful of exceptions, we the experts really did not predict the crisis, when we were in the crisis, we vastly underestimated the pernicious nature, the corrosive effect on uh, principle around the world. If you're sitting as an investor in the audience, and maybe you're an investment committee member, or maybe you're picking mutual funds for your uh, neighbor or your grandmother, 
how, what would you recommend, what questions would you suggest investors ask of their money managers, of the people that they are entrusting with their wealth, whether it's investors directly, uh, mutual funds, et cetera, to understand why the manager failed in the last several months and how to ensure some level of success going forward? I think I'll start out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I told you I was uh, glad to ask you. two very important questions, Ranji. The first one is: is what drives the firm, the person, the entity's individual investment process? What is it? What is every step of that investment process, from the research that is done to the portfolio construction done, to the output of the managers or securities chosen? That's one thing. And then within that, the guts of due diligence. What is every step of the way of the due diligence process, from looking at the operations of the entity to who's doing the auditing to who's doing the accounting to the background checks of the managers and things like that? We've opened up a whole new world of due diligence, and we have to go down to the grassroots one more time. And those are the two central questions I, that I would ask. Let me build on that. Um, I think the most important thing is just using common sense. So in the yeah. venture business or the private equity world, again, just look at the math. 2% per year for 10 years is 20% of the total capital. If the, if the manager is just putting up 1% of the fee but taking 20% over, over the 10 years, the math's pretty good for him. Mm -hmm. So, or her. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, skin in the game, quarterly reporting, Requiring people, just as you said in your due diligence, getting direct feedback from actual companies instead of just the intermediary. It's all kinds of common sense checkpoints that you have to put in place uh, to, try and, uh, you know, tr to try and make the best decisions. I think trying to understand how that person thinks and whether their thought process is compatible with your own. And you know, look, we've all been in business a long time and I love it when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, you just don't understand my business. And I say, you know, if I can't understand what you're talking about within 10 minutes, I don't think I'm going to bother. And so the people that, if you're talking to somebody and it starts sounding like a foreign language, you know, go on to something else. Because in concept, the principles here are not complicated. They haven't changed. As I said before, there's only three variables you're playing with. Okay, risk, yield, and liquidity, that's it. And we package them in a lot of different ways. And I, I, I don't know any other way to do it. And, and in fact, I don't think any, there are some people that get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, how am I gonna steal your money? But generally speaking, this is yeah. an honest group of people, but they are human and they are going to fail. Mike? Yeah, and I think the old rule of if it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. I, you know, in addition to everything that's been said, I would say you want to look forward, be very fee sensitive. I think that's very important that it was pointed out. For part of the portfolio, put it in the lowest cost fee structures that you can. There's no beta, as they call it, the ability to grow with the market is very cheap now. Even <coughs> though some people repackage it and put paint on it and put ribbons on it and they'll charge you a lot, it's extraordinarily cheap. And don't, don't pay a lot for it, but have it. And then make some interesting investments with people that you actually can see their track record and you can see how they did through good times and bad times. Uh, and I think, you know, that's about all you can do. And, uh, you know, you're, you're in this with the rest of us unless you want to sit in cash. You know, we have now, before pre-market, like in September, September of last year, we were sitting on $350 billion in money market funds at Fidelity. We're now sitting on $800 billion of money market funds. Uh, you know, it's now paying probably 40.4%. Uh, yeah. Treasuries for a couple of weeks were actually negative. You had to pay us to, to have them. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good strategy long term. So I think you do have to take, <laughs> take a deep breath. Make it up on volume. <laughs> yeah. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Find some cost effective ways to get exposed to the market carefully and then make some very good investments on a, on a wide distribution with managers that you can see a track record. I, th I think the, a lot of the, uh, some of the problems that uh, arose in the financial area clearly came uh, because of lack of transparency. Yeah. Th through all of this, I think it has become an absolute mandatory requirement on the part of all of us. You just insist on transparency. Right. Yeah. And now for your questions. 
two microphones. Sir, if you could use the microphone, that would be right behind you. I, want, <clears throat> I wonder what you uh, think will be the effect of the baby boomers retiring over the next 10 years. I'm not sure when the peak of the bubble comes, but you're going to, what effect on 401ks and generally investing in the market uh, will have? We'll start with Mike over there. It's Fidelity at 2.7 You probably trillion. manage all our 401ks. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, what we're seeing, interestingly enough, is um, a huge amount of money roll out of the 401ks into personally controlled accounts. Uh, people are very, the, the numbers, you know, when, you, when you're putting in $10,000 or $20,000, people are fairly brave. Then all of a sudden their whole 401k comes over. Now they're dealing with, a, you know, their retirement and now they become very concerned about the amount. And they tend to go two things, into conservative investments, which means less equities, more sort of uh, conservative, high-grade kind of bond things. And I don't think that that's bad. I know there was a concern that it would deflate the, the equity markets because all this money's coming out. It's much more subtle than that because when you retire at 55 and 65, everybody that I talk to on the phones, and I do sit and talk to these people on phones, they plan on living a whole lot longer. Okay, and so it's not like it's going to happen like they originally anticipated in a five-year rollover. It's going to be a 20, 30-year process. So I don't think you'll see the impulse that, you, that everybody was concerned about. But you will see a move to some more conservative investments for all the right reasons. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I just would uh, emphasize that point. That it kind of gets back to what Bill said before, is the liquidity spectrum. Uh, people will raise higher liquidity ratios in portfolios in the baby boomer generation than the normal investor itself. So it's kind of like a double whammy. You're, you know, the natural tendency used to be to go towards, when you get more conservative in the equity markets, you go towards large cap value. Well, if you look at where all, a lot of the problems have been over the last 20 years, many of them have been in the large cap value space for obvious reasons, balance sheet reasons, et cetera. Um, but I think you're going to turn things upside down right now. You're going to start to see a significant movement towards uh, going from two or three asset classes to eight at the level one right. level that Mike talked about before. And you're going to start to see these new funds come out that are called all weather and have the ability to kind of work themselves through any cycle. And on the margin, that's going to be cons more conservative than what we've seen. More questions? Sir. You sound, sound quite bullish. And my question to you is, this is a bit like a forest fire, uh, a large forest fire that we've gone through. You could say it's contained, but it's not controlled yet. What worries you? What would make you feel that we're in for some really harder times than you would hope right now? I think, uh, you know, obviously another shock. And, uh, you know, where would that shock come from? You would have thought by this time all of the shocks would be out on the, on the table and be visible given the process of deleveraging that we've been, uh, been going through and uh, the higher requirement that people have put on for requiring better transparency. Uh, look, you know, uh, part of what I'm about to say is cultural. A uh, long time ago, my dad said to me, uh, you have to remember two things. In the United States, we're still fighting the depression of the 30s, and there will always be a tendency to inflate, to fight the possibility of deflation. And in Europe, they're still fighting the inflation of the 20s, and particularly in Germany. So here I am, 40 years later, and I said, you know, not much has changed. If you look at what's going as recently as yesterday, Merkel in Germany, until a couple of months ago, was calling for a balanced budget. And it's just simply, as I think believed to be a cultural matter, is really resisting trying to stimulate mm -hmm. their yeah. economy. And in the United States, of course, we've thrown everything in the kitchen sink at the problem. I think if I were king for a day, I would have done the same thing. But there'll be a price to pay. Because I think if, if the Federal Reserve and the Treasury hadn't done what they did, because we were we were going toward the cliff at 65 miles an hour. We were getting pretty damn close. And the banks were not, as we heard yesterday, weren't lending to each other. The LIBOR rate spiked. I mean, the system literally had broken. Um, so, yeah, it's the forest fires contained. It is by no means over. 
calls into question, where do you leave your money? This is probably why the amount of money that Fidelity has in money markets, in spite of the fact that you've lost a trillion dollars, has more than doubled. So it's a, a disproportionate shift in the percentage of everybody's assets into cash. So down the road, whether it's two years or four years, uh, we will have uh, inflationary pressures. Where they'll come from, I don't know. Uh, we all know we're living on an economy where we are uh, buying goods from other countries, China, and they're financing that purchase, uh, the purchases that we do. I don't know how that ultimately unwinds. So by no means, um, I think that we should be, or I'll just speak personally, be thought of as being, quote, optimistic but I really, really object to being overly pessimistic yeah. because life really does go on. Uh, the human being is a remarkably adaptable animal, and it is truly amazing how quickly we all adapt. Sometimes it's a physical problem. If you lose a limb, your sight, your hearing, it's a tremendous ability to adapt. And when I was uh, uh, late 70s in London, looking down, England was having inflation, up in near 20% precursor to what we had and do it about the same time. How does, how does that happen? And the answer was, well, you know, people get up in the morning and they have to eat and they have to go somewhere and they'll figure it out. And I think what will happen is we'll figure it out. But we are all going to be uh, a little less wealthy and the ability to grow our wealth will be a little more difficult to come by. On the other hand, I don't see anybody here in a corner with a tin cup. You know, I think we're all pretty darn lucky to be born in this country when we were born. Yeah. But, so I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna at all, because there's a lot of problems out there, a lot of them. And they, I don't know how they're going to manifest themselves. I wish I did. But on the other hand, life will go on and we'll figure out how to adapt. To add to that, I guess I would say I'm cautiously optimistic with a healthy dose of reality. And that reality is resetting by about a decade. And uh, if I take the real data from my portfolio, about 35% of my companies are doing somewhere between 50, 250 million, even in this economy, in terms of top line revenue. I think about 20% of the portfolio is really in trouble and is unlikely to make it. And the remaining 45% is somewhere in between, which will play out. I think my biggest concern right now is the largest companies and consumers of technology, so the banks, uh, financial services, et cetera, are going through extraordinary amounts of uh, restructuring. So if you take that out, the largest next set of customers is going to be because of small and middle market companies. Those companies, if they don't get credit, then the whole value chain has a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, you know, as these largest companies, and a lot of people focus just on the, uh, on the very large uh, cap companies, as they're dealing and looking introspectively with their own problems, you really have to think through what the next two to three layers, which is really what drives the economy in a big way, and how we can structurally fix some of that or provide guarantees for some of that to continue to give the impetus uh, for economic uh, you know, uh, development going forward. Yeah, and, and just to answer the question from U.S. Trust perspective, we're, we're, um, we may sound pretty bullish as it relates to the economy and the sweet spot in terms of rising growth, falling inflation. That's what financial markets want. We said before that we're moose, um, precisely because we're not bears and we're not bulls. We're more on the, on the realistic side, which basically means we hit a massive reset button. And the ability for the US economy to hit a massive reset button is so much larger than any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're dealing through right now. So you get deleveraging, you get the long-term headwinds of all the Ds, dilution, deficits, and deleveraging. And then as we're working our way into that next bull phase or that next expansion, it's really, really going to be about where you came from rather than where you're going to. And that's where we are right now. Negative 6% GDP growth in the fourth quarter, slightly lower than that in the first quarter. Post Lehman, we fell off a cliff and things are a little bit better right now. So from that standpoint, that's a little dose of reality mixed with a, a little animal called uh, the moose. <laughs> we have one more question. Uh, what's your advice? Um, to investors that decide on their allocation in equities um, as to the use of ETFs versus money managers. And you talked earlier how fees eat up over 10 years into your returns, and uh, it seems that ETFs, uh, you significantly reduce your cost of having the investment. Okay, there's actually a third class in there, which is funds that are essentially index funds, right? So your cheapest funds over time are your 
your big index funds, of your big S&P kind of things. ETFs are a fine vehicle for people who like to actively trade or construct interesting portfolios. Be very careful about using them for long-term investing because they have some peculiarities about, about the way they track indexes and things that can get you into trouble. I won't go through the details here. And actively managed funds have a role, but make sure you pick ones that have actually delivered alpha. You're paying a lot of money. You should get, you should get extraordinary returns and demand that of the, the managers. When you talk to people, one of the things that financial planners should do for you, if that's what you use, is vet those people and make sure that you are getting kinds of people that can deliver under certain conditions. But I think, as I said, having buying low-cost beta, whether you do the ETFs, I, I also look at index funds, all of us have them, um, is, is, should be part of your long-term portfolio now. There's no re reason to overpay for that. This is going to sound like a chicken answer, um, but trying to keep it real again. It's a combination of ETFs, index funds, and active managers. You, you, the ETFs and the index funds, in, in our opinion, work, work most effectively in those asset classes where you obviously can't produce alpha as, as much as you want to or have in the past. Most of that is the large cap area. Most of it is the areas that are over-researched that Arjun said before. The small cap area, the emerging market area that we discussed, um, in some areas of the non-US world, that's still where there's ability to get that extra return, where you need an active manager uh, to, you know, to buy the Chinese banks, to sell the European banks, to do whatever. Um, and on the ETF side, uh, Mike, Mike is absolutely correct in terms of there's some danger signs. We talk about the short ETFs. There's that leverage factor in there where the upside movement on short ETFs can take away from any gains you get on the downside. So be very careful of that. You're asking you know, a really great question. And embedded in that is the question of actively managed versus mm -hmm. passively managed. And underneath that is relative returns versus absolute returns. Because if you're happy with riding an index, i.e. relative returns, then by all means, buy an index fund. You ride, you up, you ride down, and your relative returns will be whatever they are. Um, uh, there is quite a debate, I think, about whether active management, how much alpha the return, in fact, is added, and, and uh, how sustainable is that right. over time? Right? Because during any period of time, a manager will add alpha. Uh, uh, there's an axiom that what you shouldn't do in the mutual fund business is buy a five-star morning star fund because that was the return <laughs> from last year, right, right. not the next year, not, not necessarily predictive. And we don't have time for it, but the other part of that is the absolute versus the relative return. And so you have some, some money managers that are actually trying to, what they call, they call themselves absolute return funds, and trying to get away from being that correlated with market returns. It's a great question. Wally Obermeyer with Obermeyer Asset Management. It seems that our industry in a um, kind of institutionalized way has failed to uh, steer our clients away from inflated asset classes. And I think we could give examples of that through the decade. What, uh, projecting forward, what do you think, do you think our industry will behave better and, and what, what changes might we need to, as, as a group, uh, do a better job? Mm. <laughs> I, th I think, uh, you know, that's a great point because when, when you are in any asset management type of position, you're looking for uh, demand to drive where your product development is, quite frankly, and you're looking to come up with those areas um, that will cross a broad spectrum of investors. You can't possibly have demand for something unless there's comfort for whatever that something is, which ends up being an inflated thing to begin with. So it's an interesting question. The only way that I think we can, I can answer it has everything to do with um, something called tax efficient investing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an area that ETFs, um, the ETFs that we know can't provide. But there are tax efficient structured equity vehicles out there where you get a good 20% turnover in a portfolio every year that has a loss. And you need to harvest that losses to match it up against gains, whether it's being produced by a hedge fund or on the private equity side, which ultimately hits ordinary income because it's short term. 
um, or has a higher propensity to have taxes on it. Net net, I think it's the tax efficient structured area, which quite frankly should become more in demand given what potentially could happen with tax policy in the, in the next few years. All right. I completely agree with that answer. Um, I think tax efficiency, and I also think what Bill was suggesting is people who, for you, combine low-cost beta, don't try to sell you things that are expensive, with more actively managed uh, funds where it matters, and do that very carefully and judiciously for you, emerging markets, those kinds of things. Uh, I think that's where it's going. But I think you're speaking to the inherent human nature. Um, we talk about investors not being able to buy low and sell high. And we in the industry also propagate products when they have momentum and when investors probably have too much of a good thing. So I think some of the discipline that you are asking that we as an industry impose upon ourselves is very well said. And clearly on the private side or, or, or ordinate, uh, trying to figure out fair market value is just next to impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people, there's arguments on both sides, mark to market, when things are going really up, they want, everyone wants to try and say, hey, what is the unrealized gain? And on the other side, there's obviously other, uh, other arguments for, for cost-driven uh, valuations, et cetera. I think we have time for one more question, if someone has it. Otherwise, I want to go to a semi-lightning round. Um, any questions in the, yes, sir? Um, what do you predict for the fee structure for partnerships, private equity? <laughs> repeat the question? The question is, what do you predict for fee structures for private equities, partnerships, alternatives, as in, in general? A lot lower. <laughs> you'd you'd uh, think. Yeah. No, we're, so I, actually, I'm seeing, I, I, we're seeing it. Uh, we have a big institutional operation, and our ability to negotiate is, and we, we have the same structures. It's not something you would deal with, but the, you know, for defined benefit plans, all of those fee structures are getting compressed. And it's very, we think it's very consistent with what's happening in the hedge fund markets in general. I mean, obviously, if you've got some magic formula and you can deliver enormous returns, you can get what you want. But for the, the bulk of it, I think you're seeing fee compression across the board. Price has an inverse correlation with transparency, <laughs> regulation, um, and uh, competition. So clearly. I think the ranges have always been, you know, on the managing fee side, it's between 1% and 3% a year, depending on, uh, you know, who you're with. And on the carried interest side, it's somewhere between 20 and 30% depending on, again, uh, quality of the institution and where you are on the curve. Uh, I think the, to your point of, and, and to Mike's earlier point, is the management fee, technically, which is really the downside for the investor. And I think you're starting to see some of the smartest managers trying to align interests where there are management fee waivers, which come back in a tax effective way mm -hmm. for the general partner if the fund makes uh, uh, you know, uh, above market return. So I think you'll start seeing the smartest people will try and align interests with the investors in a, in a more rational way. I think the leverage is, uh, has changed. You know, until the, uh, the recent turmoil, the leverage was on the part of the well-known yeah. hedge fund managers, private yeah. equity managers, venture firms. And uh, obviously that dynamic is, has shifted because uh, I think the pool of capital that they think they have available is smaller than what the what is written down on their paper because I think a lot of the institutions are not going to be able to meet their uh, capital call requirements, primarily university endowments and, uh, and foundations. Uh, having, having said that, I think you'll have a more sophisticated structure where uh, much more focus on what you would call the hurdle rate before uh, promote kicks in. I couldn't agree with Arjun uh, more that uh, the management fee is is if it gets too big, you know, the manager loses some of its incentive to generate the capital return because they have so much money flowing in the door every year uh, from management fees. So I'm going to wrap this up uh, with just a series of questions, and maybe if you can start with Mike and go to Arjun. And I, and I know that nobody up here wants to be in the forecasting business, so we will try and be helpful <laughs> but also thoughtful. Um, so Mike, starting with you, uh, if you, as you look out one year and five years from now, Global equities, up a lot, up a little, down a lot, down a little. I think global, this is a time for good active management, and I think you'll see the trend go, not up a lot, I'd say up medi medium is a good place to be. Bill? Different from where it is now. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I had one, one person who just refused. Uh, up a little between now and in one year, up a lot, uh, five years. Wow. 
up a little one year and I'd say up medium in five years. Right. How about borrowing costs? Not treasury yields, but the real cost to borrow for a company, let's say a double A rated company, same horizon, one year and five years, Arjun? So up a, uh, subjectively? Say, yes. I'd say, uh, so double A is from, from, from today. From today. Okay. So are we going to see higher borrowing costs one year from now and five year, or five years from now mm -hmm. by a little, by a lot? I'd say it's going to go up in one year and should come down in five years. I would agree. I think up in one year is all this new movement towards regulatory structures and uh, et cetera, cost of capital will rise at companies, but in general, over five year period, rates are staying low for a long time. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be lower in a year because right now rates are uh, very high if in fact you can borrow money. Mm -hmm. And in five years from now, I really don't have any idea what will be in the economic cycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I sort of, at you, it really depends on what happens to inflation in the five-year period. Mm -hmm. So uh, implicit inflation forecast in my next question, the dollar. And let's look out a long time horizon. Let's look out 10 years. Will it be as vitally relevant around the world as it is today, less relevant or irrelevant? Mm. Mm. Well, that, this one I'm borrowing from a lot of people who've written that regardless of what you think about the dollar, the rest of the world is coming up alongside of us. So I think it'll be less relevant. I think we're just too big of an economic powerhouse to be irrelevant. So I'll just use less relevant at this point. I would agree. I agree. I agree. OK. Um, what policy action by our elected officials could be most derailing to the market's confidence in the next year? Just generally uh, interference in the uh, capital allocation process. if they screw up on the capital markets reform, which is coming up for sure? Two, two things. A change in fiscal policy too quick before the recovery actually takes hold prior to 2011. And a uh, change in monetary policy thinking that deflation's over and it's not. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would agree with those. Okay. Um, while it's really hard as we sit here to even imagine this next question, we know about human nature, so I'll ask it anyway. What asset class or market is already or will be the next likely bubble candidate? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Green tech. <laughs> well, you could, yeah. I don't know about what is in a bubble right now, but what is building a bubble for the next 20 years is hard assets. And we're still early. No takers for treasuries? No? All right. Yeah. Uh, last question. Over the next six months, what do you expect to invest in, change, or just sell in your personal portfolio? <laughs> well, you know, we own companies or part of companies, and uh, I'm not sure any of them are saleable at this point because <laughs> of, the, uh, no, of the environment. It's that uh, lack of credit availability, and one of the more precious assets we have in one company is the capital structure that we could actually give to somebody else if we sold it. And that's a, it's a, a, a value component that's not on the balance sheet per se. And so uh, I, I've been approached to buy one company and of course they want to buy it on the cheap and I keep saying, you know, this is not my idea. If you want to buy it, here's the price. And, and so you have some of the, what you might go, I don't know if we're at the bottom, but feeding down here. And I think the, uh, the, only, the only reason you would actually sell an asset at this point, if you thought you were going to get fair value, not likely, or you had to. Uh, one traditional, one non-traditional. I've I already explained that I think getting some, you know, if there's going to be a bubble and it's going to be 10 years long, you want to own it till nine years, right? So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think, I think hard assets, which I, I use the word commodities in one form or another, is the obvious one. And I'll tell you one that's not obvious that we're looking is we think volatility is here to stay. And uh, so we're actually constructing ways to essentially you can buy that volatility mm -hmm. and benefit from a sideways market. Yeah. On a, on a personal balance sheet uh, basis, I, I would agree with, with Mike on the hard assets and potential volatility dampening type of um, solutions. What does that really mean for me when lending is scarce and capital is scarce? raising the illiquid portion of your portfolio is the right thing to do if you can buy time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess uh, 
to Bill's earlier point on liquidity, I've kind of doubled, um, generally speaking, rule of thumb, my liquidity requirement just for a safety cushion. But I'm a buyer right now, and I'm actually buying in my own fund of people who are trying to sell because I, I truly do believe they're trying to yeah. Yeah. sell at the wrong time. Yeah. Well, thank you all for the panel, and thanks for being here.